is in the silent one and we can begin. So in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the May 23rd, 2022 meeting of the Policy Review Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's Policy Review Committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams Live on the BCPS website. To conduct this meeting by virtual means, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Clark or Ms. Howie if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Clark, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Causey? Dr. Hager? Present. Ms. Hen? Present. Ms. Mack? Present. Ms. Rowe? Present. Mr. Thomas? You have a quorum, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Please call the roll of the staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. Yarbrough? Present. Ms. Anderson? Present. Ms. Howie? Present. Dr. McComas? Present. Mr. Dixit? Present. Ms. Ferguson? Present. Ms. Becker? Present. Mr. Plate? Present. Mr. Roberts? Present. Mr. Taylor? Present. Ms. Watts Hitchcock. Present. Did I fail to call any staff members' names? Okay, thank you. Ms. Ms. Clark, Clark. Brief records. Ms. Causey is here. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, so first item is policy 4103, child abuse and neglect. Presenting is Ms. Anderson, Dr. McComas, Ms. Ferguson, and Ms. Watts Hitchcock. Ms. Anderson and Dr. McComas, please proceed. Thank you. Good evening, board members and BCPS staff. We're presenting policy 4103, child abuse and neglect for review and approval with minimal changes. Here today to review and answer questions on behalf of the Division of Curriculum and Instruction are Ms. Kim Ferguson, Executive Director, Department of Social Emotional Support, and on behalf of the Division of Human Resources, Ms. Bobette Watts-Hitchcock, Investigation Supervisor. I'll turn it over to Ms. Ferguson and Ms. Watts-Hitchcock. You're muted, Ms. Um, Watts-Hitchcock. I didn't know if Kim wanted to start on her end or I can, it doesn't matter. No, you matter. can go ahead. I, okay. I was, I was waiting for you. Go ahead. No problem. Good evening, everyone. Um, the things that I'd like to point out about this policy, first of all, it's very important to the work that we do because my office primarily does investigations on child abuse, child neglect, inappropriate behavior. Um, so it's a, it's a heavy subject matter, but it's very important to keep our children safe, which is our number one goal. Here, some of the things that I wanted to point out as far as changes in the policy are that um, it clearly now, not that it didn't before, but now it's in writing that it includes vulnerable adult students. So before we talked about child abuse and it was 18 and under, but we have students who are older than 18 who have disabilities. And so we wanna make sure because we've had a few cases involving them that they are included and they are now. So that's important to us. Um, the, um, the other thing is there are the definition for volunteer. So when we um, we look at volunteer applications, um, again, we know that volunteers are supervising our children on field trips and classrooms sometimes, et cetera. So again, it's a safety issue. And although we do not fingerprint volunteers, we do hold them to the same standards that we do as employees. So we use the same list of criminal um, background, history, we look at all of that. However, it's only if they self-disclose, but this 
policy makes it clear uh, who the volunteers are. Another thing I wanted to point out is that oftentimes in an investigation, we'll have employees, uh, community members calling in, but they want to remain anonymous because they're fearful of um, getting sued or I'm going to get somebody in trouble. So again, there is immunity for, for civil liability that's um, or criminal penalty. So it's it's good to have that in writing so that we can point that out to people that are um, cooperating with our investigations. And as you may know, we do need the cooperation of witnesses because I can't be in every classroom and every office and see what's going on. So witnesses are very important to what we do. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is that uh, Comar has added grooming. We've we've seen grooming behaviors for many years, but we weren't. It didn't have the teeth that it does now. But now that it's in the law, um, we do believe that we can pull it out more now um, because we can put it in here under the inappropriate behavior. We can talk about grooming behaviors, which are very scary and unfortunately are very real. As as we know, we have great employees, but um, they come from all different backgrounds and um, we do have some predators at BCPS and so we want to weed them out and so when we see grooming behaviors it's certainly a red flag if not just a pink flag and so it's important um, that that is now something that we can use. So those were the main points that I wanted to make. Um, Kim probably has things to add from her vision of what she does. Thank you, uh, Ms. Watts Hitchcock. Um, one of the things that my office is responsible for is really around the uh, mandated annual training um, that's provided to um, staff members. And I just wanted to reiterate the fact that that is an annual training that we provide staff members on um, how to report child abuse and or neglect, um, the process for doing so. Um, we um, in each school, there's a child abuse uh, what we call a CPS liaison, and that representative receives an extra layer of training to support staff um, so that they um, know how the procedures for reporting child abuse and neglect, and then they worked with the principals to make sure they're made aware. Um, right now, our training is um, electronic, so it's a best, the best way of keeping track of whether or not staff have completed it through that Safe Schools module. Um, so th that has been working for us over the past few years. That way we can keep track of who who has been trained and who hasn't been trained and follow up um, with school based staff in such a large school system. It helps us to do a better job of tracking who's completed that training. So we're, we're primarily responsible for working with staff with that. Um, Board members, are there any questions? Ms. Mack? Yes, um, thank you very much for this information. I was a volunteer in BCPS schools before I became a board member, and I am currently a licensed foster parent and have worked with foster kids for many, many years, many of whom come into care for these very things. But does the volunteer training that's referenced on page two, line 15, explicitly state that volunteers are mandated reporters and how, if not, how would a volunteer know the responsibility he or she has to do so? So volunteers are, as you, it, it does explicitly say that they are, um, they are required to support, um, to report child abuse and neglect. Um, they go through a volunteer training um, that is actually held by its, it's done in collaboration with our office. I think I believe it's uh, community involvement. Um, they have a separate um, volunteer training that's separate from staff training, but my staff um, in the Office of School Counseling works with that representative to ensure that they receive the, um, the appropriate child abuse and or neglect training. So, so for each volunteer in BCPS, there is a checklist that each volunteer has had that training. So there, there are, there's required training. I'm not sure about a checklist. So they there is required training for volunteers. I'm sorry. They receive a certificate saying that they've completed the volunteer training. I do. I have seen those. And so the volunteer training speaks about the re responsibility for mandated reporting and when a mandated reporting is required. That mandated reporting is required. So when you suspect 
child abuse and or neglect, you're you're mandated to report. It's not really a win. It's if you have a suspicion, you're you're mandated to report as a volunteer, as an employee, as a service provider. I understand that very clearly, but I'm wondering if all of our volunteers understand what what requires being reported. Um, if a volunteer says to a student, oh, how did you get that bruise on your face? And the student looks fearful for a minute and says, I'm not allowed to tell you or something that doesn't sit right. That's just a vague suspicion that the volunteer may have. And a lot of people are concerned. And I, I know the policy talks about um, people are covered with liability. I, I just want to make it as clear for volunteers as possible when they are mandated to report because they are the people in the school sometimes who kids do go to with problems. So there is, so as I mentioned in the beginning about the training, there is a CPS liaison in each school. So even if a, a teacher has a question about whether or not they should move forward with uh, reporting, that CPS liaison receives an additional layer of support to help teachers, volunteers, and staff persons work through whether or not they should move forward with that report. So they, they don't have to feel like they're alone um, in that in making that decision. And I understand how people can be hesitant, um, but if they there is they should know who the CPS liaison is and definitely we can make sure that, that that's being made aware of. But there is one in every school and that person would say whether or not you know, Ms. Ferguson, you should move forward with reporting because it should be, um, it should be the um, the person who suspect suspect suspected the abuse should be making the report. It shouldn't be secondhand in that case. I agree. Thank you, Ms. Kazi. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Thank you for the presentation of this very, very important policy. Um, I just wanted to ha ask staff to clarify in the training, I'm trying to find it, um, that the training includes the policy and procedures. And I'm trying to find that statement now. If staff could direct me to the line number. I'm not sure that I understand the question, ma'am. Can you oh, clarify? So the I wanted to review, have staff review the <clears throat> sentence in this policy draft that references the training that is required. I see on page three, line 29, paragraph F, all employees are required to receive instruction annually and upon hire on the prevention, identification, and reporting of child abuse, child neglect, and child sexual abuse. Yes. I'm not sure what the question is. Okay. So that's, that's the, re required, um, the required instruction. That's the required annual training. OK, and is that stated the same as the law states? It is not a direct quote of the statute, if that's what you're asking, ma'am. Um, yes, that is what I'm asking. Could I have uh, someone from staff read the statute? That relates to the training. Kim, do you have access to the statute? I don't have it right this minute. I'll I'll look it up really quickly. Give me a okay. second. Thank you, ma'am.
Ms. Rowe? Yes. In the interest of time, while staff are working on this, um, other board members, I think, had questions. If it's okay with Ms. Causey, can we? Are there other board members with questions? I don't see anyone else. Mr. Thomas, I believe, was waiting. He had Mr. his hand. Thomas. Oh, I didn't see his hand. Mr. Thomas, did you have questions? Sorry, no questions. I just wanted to state for the record that I was here, but okay. we talked about the chat. Did anyone else have questions? Or are we just finishing Ms. Causey's questions? I think we're just finishing Ms. Causey's questions. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. So I did I did find in um, the Maryland Code Education um, 5, what is it, 6 113 dot one in 2018, annual instruction required components. A county board or non-public school that receives state funds shall require each employee to receive instruction annually on the prevention, identification, and reporting of child sexual abuse. The instruction described in paragraph one of this subsection shall include comprehensive training and information to help employees to recognize. Um, this is mainly related to sexual misconduct. Um, recognize sexual misconduct in adults, recognize and appropriately respond to um, sexual, sexually inappropriate coercive abusive behaviors among minors, recognize behaviors and verbal cues that could indicate a minor that has become a victim of child abuse and neglect, respond to disclosures by minors or their parents or guardians of child abuse, Policy support, and this is this one is basically related to sexual abuse. This is the updated one. So, Ms. Ferguson, we've put the the statute in the chat. Okay. For the reference of the board members, but thank you for getting to it faster than Ms. Clark or I could. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. So, is our is this that uh, is spelled out in the chat that um, Ms. Ferguson was reading aloud? Is this in the superintendent's rule? The precise language you mean? Yes. Not to my recollection is the precise language that's in the statute in the rule as drafted, but the rule will be completed when the board has passed the policy. The rule is being worked on now, so we're unable to tell you whether or not in the final policy uh, the same language will be repeated. That's not been our practice. Well, I think um, to dovetail with the earlier board members' comments, it's um, important especially related to this very important policy regarding student safety um, to be explicit in the expectations for employees, volunteers and service providers. So if this language is not going to be in the policy, um, then I would um, ask that it be in the superintendent's rule, and I can make a motion to, or Miss um, Rowe can ask for um, consensus on it being included in the superintendent's rule recommended by the committee. So, so the, Ms. Ozzie, the be, committee, sorry, the committee doesn't dictate what goes into the superintendent's rules, um, but I think this language, what specifically in the rules? is less of a concern than what's in the training for the volunteers and the teachers and the staff to make sure that they know how to articulate exactly what these behaviors are. Is staff working on those types of documents and things? Can you restate your question? Give me a sec. I was I was looking for I was looking at the rule, but tell me restate so your question. I understand where Ms. Causey's headed with wanting this in the rule, but I guess what I'm wondering is 
If it's not in the policy and it's not in the rule, is it in training handbooks for staff? Is it in volunteer training? Is it in how are we going to be training our staff? To Because this is a statute, so it has to be implemented, whether it's articulated in our policies or rules or not. So what I want to know is how are we going to be training our staff and our volunteers into precisely what constitutes this type of behavior? Now, I know volunteers just report anything they're concerned about to staff, but to me, it seems like, you know, boundary violating behaviors. What does that mean? If a kid right. falls so in the, pool, in the currently in the training, we do discuss what grooming looks like. Um, that that's explicitly stated, like the definition of grooming, what it looks like, um, you know, behaviors that would be considered crossing the line. Mm -hmm. um, that is included in the training, as well as what abuse looks like, what neglect looks like. Um, and so all of that is actually explicitly stated because we don't want people to assume um, what it looks like. Um, so bruises and, you know, the difference between corporal punishment and abuse, all of that is has always been explicitly stated in the training. OK, I would so, encourage that the rule be detailed. So um, we need to. Sorry, go ahead, Miss Howie. Prior, excuse me, uh, members of the committee, uh, as you're well aware and as staff have articulated, this is a key policy to making sure our students are kept safe. And yes, it is required by law, but I believe we also have a moral and an ethical obligation to make sure that our kids are safe. So in terms of being explicit, one of the cautions I would provide is that if you over define conduct, it's possible that conduct that is not defined would still be considered child abuse uh, by CPS, by the police. So I would caution you about being too explicit as well about grooming behaviors. What we have told employees is that if you have a doubt, you report. We would prefer people over report to keep our kids safe rather than them assume that they know what child abuse looks like. And there was many years ago, I'm dating myself, it was under Dr. Hairston, we had an employee who assumed that a certain behavior was not child abuse, failed to report it because that was his conclusion and is no longer working for us because that was his conclusion without reporting that behavior. So we encourage as much as possible our staff to over report as opposed to under report. So again, this is obviously it's a very, very important policy for the school system, but I would simply encourage you to make sure that we are uh, we are communicating that importance in a way that that, that doesn't on the back end prevent us from fulfilling our obligations to our kids and families. Thank you, Ms. Howie. Um, if there are no amendments to this policy, does anyone object to policy 4103 moving forward for Ms. first Rose, reading? I have an amendment I'm working I'm on. Sorry. What was that? I have an amendment I'm working on putting in the chat. Okay. And Mr. And Thomas, Ms. comment. So if you could go to him. Mr. Thomas, so you I had a comment. Thank you. Yes. So I was just reviewing uh, board policy 1260, which is uh, attached as related policies and for volunteer training, and it does explain the online volunteer training process. Um, after hearing this, how uh, my comment was going to be that I, I think it could be important if we maybe outline what are some specific things that should be in the online training process uh, in this board policy. I think that could be important. Um, hearing Ms. Howie's comments about you know, the necessity of, just, uh, of maybe not being too specific so that uh, our students, so that our volunteers, our teachers don't feel, feel as if they're, they're coming to their own conclusions. Um, I think it would be important to that if we do do that, to just make sure it says like at least uh, including these, these information. Um, I don't know. I, I, I just think that I don't like that. It's not anywhere in our policy. Um, what is what was stated in, in statute um, and, and described below. So I was also um, 
typing up an amendment to that matter. Um, but I, I think Ms. Hens might be in, in a similar fashion, so I'm sure hers is, is more well put together. <laughs> Thank you for your faith. <laughs> Mr. Thomas. I'm ready, Ms. Rowe. When Go ahead, Ms. Hen. Thank you. I move to amend policy 4103 by replacing all employees are required to re receive instruction annually and upon hire on the prevention, identification, and reporting of child abuse, child neglect, and child sexual abuse with all employees are required to receive comprehensive instruction annually and upon hire on the prevention, identification, and reporting of child abuse, child neglect, and child sexual abuse to include the objectives as defined in state law. Second, Ms. Causey. Uh, are there any comments, questions, et cetera, on this motion, Mr. Thomas? Thank you. I move to amend Ms. Causey's motion to add at least after include. So it would read, all employees are required to receive comprehensive instruction annually and upon hire on the prevention, identification, and reporting of child abuse, child neglect, and child sexual abuse to include at least the objectives as defined in state law. Is there a second? Would you, would you second. be a Mac? Would you be open to at minimum? Yeah, uh, Ms. Mac seconded. So yes, it depends. Is there something else that given that this is board policy and the staff clearly wants to adhere to follow uh, board policy? May I ask exactly what is anticipated by at minimum? That you, at could, least? That you could go beyond what's in state law if you mm -hmm. want to. Also, to me, it's, it's saying that it, we're not we're not just explicitly outlining what things are outlined in state law for our volunteers to notice and to come and to try to come to conclusions. So it's saying that any if they see really see anything, then besides what's in state law, that they should be able to report it. Um, but this also, I just want to state, it only says employees are required to see this comprehensive instruction annually. I do think we should also think of our volunteers. Employees um, are defined as volunteers under the policy, Mr. Thomas. Employees are defined as volunteers. OK, definition section, sir. Yes, but volunteers aren't aren't defined by employees, right? As employees, if you look in the definition section of this policy. We've included volunteers under the definition or within the definition of employees. OK, sorry, you said employees are are. Well, OK, thank you. That makes okay, sense. OK, so for the purposes of this policy, whenever we write employees, we include mm -hmm. volunteers. OK. OK, so um, first excuse me, excuse me, Ms. Ms. Go ahead. So, um, in the draft that I have. The on page one employee, the definition does not include volunteer. Um, there is a separate definition on page two, line eight, volunteer includes parents, guardians, and other family members, as well as other members of the community interested in the education of children who donate, donate their time to support the student of BCPS. Thank you, so, Ms. Crosby. That was my error. So um, I, following along, I do have the same question as Mr. Thomas regarding Ms. Hen's motion because she may need to make additional motions to the separate paragraphs that address uh, paragraph, let's see, D. So I, I just wanted to point that out and then staff can make a recommendation as how to uh, make, make it inclusive. Ms. Howie, could we change the definition of employee to also include volunteers in that list of people? Oh, we have a definition for volunteer as well. OK, so do we need to change the language of the motion to say all employees and volunteers? But yes, Mr. Thomas. I, I don't think we can change the 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 um the language says annually, and I don't think we can require that our volunteers are annually trained. We 
we actually do require volunteers to be annually trained every year. Okay. Well, in then fact, I my understanding is as a parent, I can't do a single thing in the building unless I've taken the volunteer training, including attend a music concert or something of that nature. So parents already do this annually and it's a whole video thing. So we can include that in the video thing. Okay, I was drafting up a separate amendment that was specific to volunteers because I didn't think that is true, but I see Ms. Howie's shaking her head. So yeah, okay, I agree. <laughs> I can put I've a taken it. The Dr. Hager has a comment, Ms. Rowe. Go ahead, Dr. Hager. Um, thank you. I, I support the motion to specify the training for the employees, but I do have concerns about um, having the volunteer training expanded to this degree. I know the volunteer training is meant to include the, you know, the important points, which I know most of this is covered in that, but, um, but the employee training, I imagine, is more comprehensive that's required annually for our employees. Is that correct? Could could something like this be put into the volunteer training and not make it cumbersome for for parent volunteers in the school? I, I'm just concerned about that. I don't want to. I don't want to deter volunteers from coming into the school because we're requiring a large amount of training to get in the door. If anyone um, at the system level has a comment on that, but I agree with Ms. Rowe. I, I, I'm familiar with the volunteer training that you, to, to get into the classrooms. Um, and even that I tend to forget to do it and do it at the last minute and try to rush through it. Um, but at the same time, I don't I would hate for it to be extra, extra long. So I don't think anyone who has designed the training is on for parents, for volunteers, excuse me, is on today's call. Uh, so I'm unable to answer how much longer uh, the training would be if we included more comprehensive information in the child abuse and neglect training for our volunteers. Thank you, Ms. Howie. Um, Ms. Rowe? Okay, so we need to process this amendment. Um, let's process Mr. Thomas's I, amendment for at minimum, and then we can look at the second amendment for how to deal with the volunteer thing. So, Ms. Clark, would you call the roll for the amendment to put the yes. word at minimum into after the word include in Ms. Uh, Hen's motion? Yes, Ms. Causey. Yes. Dr. Hager. Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Six in favor. Okay. Um, Ms. Howie, if we were to include all employees and volunteers are required to receive comprehensive, would that mean that the volunteers and the employees would have to receive the exact same training? or could what's viewed as comprehensive for a volunteer be interpreted by the school system as different than what's considered comprehensive for an employee? On behalf of staff, I would ask for more guidance from the board. I would not want to assume that if the board included volunteers in the same section, that the board was bifurcating the type of training that volunteers as opposed to uh, those who are employed by the system want to receive or are to receive. Okay, so then Ms. I'm Rowe, can I speak to that. Yeah, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, so with the I went back and read the wording um, as proposed. There's nothing in it that states that the training has to be the same for employees and volunteers, which I like, um, only that it meets the objectives as defined by state law. What that looks like for employees and volunteers can be different based on the role and even though the objectives could be the same. So I, I believe that, I think we're okay with it as is and leaving it open to develop training that's customized based on your, your role. Just as in whether you're um, a teacher versus an administrator, you know, your training might look different, but you can still meet the objectives as defined, if that makes sense. Okay, so do we want to include the word volunteers 
employees and volunteers, or do we want to leave the motion as it is? Is there any consensus in the committee? Mr. Thomas? I, I do have a slight concern because it says and receive instruction annually and upon hire. So I, with Ms. Howie's comment, I think maybe it might be better if we just under F have an E that is, or G that says all volunteers, service providers or volunteers or, or something separate. I think we should separate them out just because there is a distinction between what an educator would be getting annually and then uh, and upon hire. Does anyone opinion. object to that? I I believe we need, sorry, this is Ms. Hen. I believe we need to make it explicit here and I would support adding volunteers and changing hire to um, commencement or start prior to start. So Ms. Hen. Eric, it applies to both. Does it matter if we make it explicit here or if we make it explicit in another bullet? So like have this section, but then have another language for volunteers. I would rather, because this is so important, I would feel more comfortable making it explicit here so that volunteers know, yes, you need training. Yes, right, you need well, it. Yes, you need well, an annual. Yes, it is an amendment then. Is there an amendment to add to add and volunteers after employees? Ms. Rowe, I'm putting something in the chat unless Ms. Penn yeah. wants to put it. I'll move to insert and volunteers after all okay. employees. So she, Ms. Kazi's amendment is after employees to add service providers and volunteers and to replace hire with start. Ms. Hen, I'm not sure exactly what you're striking and inserting. So if you could I, clarify for the purposes of processing the motion and making sure that um, we've clearly recorded how you want the policy change. Yes, I move to insert and I'm putting this in the chat and volunteers and strike higher and insert start miss miss hen i would just before you hit mm -hmm. enter, i would include service providers because that's those are the three groups defined employees, service providers, and volunteers. Is there consensus on the committee? Any objections? No. Okay. Let me update the answer. Volunteers. These volunteers. Thank you, Mrs. Cosby. As a staff member, am I able to make a comment at this point? Yes, you may. OK, thank you. I'm a little concerned about the service provider. Um, insertion because we deal with lots of outside contractors who are not our employees. I mean, we treat them like employees, but we don't pay them. So that it scares me to think how will we get this annual training to outside contractors um, because it says including the contractors, direct employees, subcontractors, and or independent um, contractors. That's thousands of people. Possibly. Maybe they have to certify that they have trained their own independent contractors. And would we be providing them that training? Because that sounds like a, a negotiation of, of contracts issue. But I mean, according to the state statute, they have to be trained too. So okay. we, you know, we can't have a service provider driving a bus not be trained. And we have a lot of bus contractors and bus aid contractors and you know the statute says they have to be trained there's no reason the policy shouldn't 
Okay, thank you. Okay, so the, the motion to amend is to insert volunteers and service providers and strike hire and insert start. Does everyone understand that? So it might be clearer, ma'am, if you read the motion as it's to be amended. Okay, so it would read all employees, uh, volunteers and service providers are required to receive comprehensive instruction annually and upon start on the prevention, identification and reporting of child abuse, child neglect and child sexual abuse to include the objectives as defined in state law. Ms. Clark, could you call the roll on that language? Ms. Causey? Was we're there voting. a second to? We're voting on the amendment. I'll second the amendment. OK, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, did Mr. The, Thomas have a comment amendment. on the amendment or is that after? Mr. Thomas? It's on the amendment, yeah. What's your comment on the amendment? OK, so if by saying all employees, volunteers and service providers in this one sentence, we're not saying that they could be differentiated. So all employees, service providers and. We're basically saying that they all, I, I would think that all would have to have the same training. I know we just, we just discussed this, but there, we're not differentiating anything there. So I was thinking maybe. Maybe we should say something about like or do we want them to be differentiated between each? I think we just let staff do what they feel is necessary for each group to comply with the statute. OK, um, I just want to put something in chat. I mean, we can vote. Th that's not relevant to this amendment, but well, but we need to vote on this amendment before okay. we can consider anything else. Um, Ms. Clark, could you call the roll on the language on the amended? On the amendment, Ms. Causey. Yes. Dr. Hager. No. Ms. Han. Yes. Ms. Mack. Yes. Mr. Thomas. Yes. Ms. Rowe. Yes. Okay, five. Okay, the amendment carries. Is there another amendment on this um, motion, Mr. Thomas? Yes, I move to insert training may be differentiated between employees, service providers and volunteers to the end of this paragraph. Is there a second? Second, Mac. Are there any um, comments? Ms. Clark, I had a question. Call? OK, Did go ahead, Ms. Kazi. We are really behind schedule, so if we could pick this up. Yes, certainly. Um, is can staff tell us currently if training is differentiated? So yes, training is differentiated. Um, the training that, um, so for example, with service providers, um, training provided to our bus drivers is done um, in a different format than because some of them don't have access to the technology. So a lot of times the training is done in person for them um, as they come on board. Um, with volunteers, as you know, there's a link for that. Um, and that link is different from the link that the employees have, which is a much more comprehensive training. Any more questions on this amendment? I have one, Ms. Rowe. Go ahead, Ms. Han. Thank you. Um, obviously, I support this. We, we talked about differentiation. I'm just wondering if this belongs in the policy or the rule as it seems operational, and do we need it in the policy? If staff could comment. So, so members of the board, there is there are several pieces here that could be considered operational uh, to the extent that uh, that is the case and is the case uh, in many policies that are passed that uh, staff has discussed. The, the answer is whether or not or the question is whether or not the board wishes this in policy. OK, um, are there any other questions on the amendment? Ms. Clark, would you call the roll on the amendment, please? 
Yes, Miss Kazi. I'm passing right now. Come to come back to me, please. Dr. Hager. Yes. Miss Hen. No. Miss Mack. Yes. Mr. Thomas. Yes. Miss Rowe. Yes. Miss Causey. Yes. Okay, the motion carries. So now we are going to vote on the uh, motion as amended. All employees, volunteers, and service providers are required to receive comprehensive instruction annually and upon start on the prevention, identification, and reporting of child abuse, child neglect, and child sexual abuse to include the objectives as defined in state law. Training may be differentiated between employees, service providers, and volunteers. Ms. Clark, would you call the roll on that? Ms. Causing? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Passed. Okay, if there are no objections or further amendments, oh. policy. 4103 will be moved to first reader. Are there any objections or amendments? Ms. Rowe, I had um, put in the chat previously uh, and just recently. Yeah, I had another question on page three. OK, quickly, please. Thank you. Um, page three, line 34. It reads retaliation against an individual who makes a good faith report of suspected child abuse or neglect or who testifies, assists, or participates in an investigation or other proceeding involving violations of this policy is strictly prohibited. Um, and then it reads, a person who violates prohibition against retaliation shall be subject to discipline. Um, there is no definition of an individual so I think it should be, it should include board employee, service provider, or volunteer, um, again, to be explicit. And also the language is um, not clear where it says, or other proceeding involving violations of this policy, um, or proceeding involving, um, because it's not violating the policy for someone to report something. So that that doesn't seem clear. I'm open to I'm open to wording and also for um, committee chair row, if you could see if there's consensus about adding in so, replacing an individual with board employee, service provider, or volunteer. I actually think that it's better to say an individual. I don't know that an individual needs a definition because I think that includes any human being. And you could conceivably have a parent who's not a volunteer who just happens to be in the building picking up their kid. They see something, they report it, and then what this policy doesn't protect them from retaliation. Where I feel like if you say an individual, it protects literally anyone who reports abuse from retaliation. And I feel like if somebody's going to go so far as to report abuse, they need protection from retaliation. And I feel like that having it be an individual broadens that to literally anyone who reports abuse is protected from retaliation, as opposed to only protecting board employee service providers and volunteers. What about protecting kids from retaliation who report abuse of other kids? Or, you know, there's any number of people, the guy who's filling the Coke machines inside the school, you know, like the vending guy, right? Like there's random people that if they saw something and reported it, we would definitely want them protected from retaliation. So I don't know that I have a problem with the language and individual because that encompasses the entire human race. Ms. Rowe, I think those are excellent points. Um, I would I would change my um, 
my suggestion to see if there is consensus to add on page three um, line 34. Committee members? Including employee, employee, and employee service provider or volunteer. Committee members? Is there anyone else who wanted to do that? Okay, so hearing none, I'm assuming there wouldn't be a second. Um, Mr. Thomas, did you have a comment? You're muted. Thank you. I was just going to say, I, I I think an individual encompasses those three roles, um, but if it would make Ms. Cosby more feel more comfortable by explicitly stating them, then I don't think that would do any harm either. Um, so I guess I'll second. Um, Okay. Um, is there any uh, debate on adding after an individual retaliates, including a board employee, service provider, or volunteer? Okay. Ms. Clark, would you call the roll on amending that language, please? Ms. Causey? Yes. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Passed. Okay, that motion carries. So now we will This is a feat of intellectual acrobatics here cuz now I have to go through the chat and find all the amendments. Okay. All employees Nope, that's not the right one. Miss Holly, do you have the motion as amended? <laughs> do you have it written down because there's three amendments now. And you've passed, all three amendments have been passed. So it would now be appropriate to present to the assembly whether or not the uh, policy as amended can proceed to first reader. Okay. Ms. Clark, would you call the roll on um, the policy as amended proceeding to first reader? Yes, Ms. Causey. Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. Okay, policy 4103 will proceed to first reader. The next item, and committee members, if we could, we really have to pick up our pace if we're going to make it through even half of our agenda. Um, so Madam Chair, may uh, those staff members who are here for uh, policy 4103 be excused? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so item two is policy 1300, use of school facilities. Uh, Dr. Yarbrough and Mr. Dixit, please proceed. Good evening, board members and BCPS staff. The Department of Facilities and Strategic Planning are here to present revisions, proposed revisions, to policy 1300, use of school facilities. Here to present are Pete Dixit, Executive Director of Facilities and Strategic Planning. He is joined by Elizabeth Becker, Director, Office of Facilities Operations. Mm -hmm. At this time, I'll turn it over to Mr. Dixit. Thank you, Dr. Yarbrough, and good evening, uh, Chair Rowe and members of the board. Uh, we are here to present policy 1300 tonight for your approval. It deals with use of facilities by community group, uh, in-house groups, uh, and outside organization. Uh, the changes that we have in the policy incorporate language that has been recommended by uh, law office as per the state law, clarifying facilities can only be used 
when they do not interfere with school activities and they comply with all state and federal laws. We have also looked at the uh, compliance with the acceptable editing conventions. Uh, there are no fiscal impact uh, as a result of these changes and we are here to answer any questions you have and request your approval. Ms. Hen, I believe you have some motions you wanted to make. I do. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. And I put my motions in the chat. They look long, but I, I promise they're not as long as they look in the chat there. There's going to be a couple of motions. Minor. Do you want to take first? Um, they it's I've got them constructed as one because they're a lot of very small um, edits. Excuse me. OK, committee members, could you just read through them quickly and let me know if you want to break them out or do them all as one? Does anyone object to doing them all as one motion? OK, so Ms. Hen, go ahead and state your motion. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. I move to amend policy 1300 by deleting for these purposes from line 12 and moving the remaining language in that section from 1A to 3G. The board may re refuse the use of any school facility if it appears that the use is likely to one, provoke or add to a public riot or breach of the peace, or two, create a clear and present danger to the peace and welfare of the county or state. And deleting, quote, for community purposes from line nine and replacing the use of school facilities for cultural, civic, educational, recreational, and charitable purposes is a longstanding practice with the board encourages the use of school facilities for community purposes, including but not limited to the presentation and discussion of public questions, public speaking, lectures, and other civic, educational, social, or recreational purposes or church affiliated civic purposes and inserting after the replacement language Partisan political organizations with at least 10% of the vote cast in Maryland and in the last general election may use school facilities for meetings that relate to the election of a candidate to public office. And this language is all from the statute. Um, we use language from the statute, um, the new language that's being added that my motion moves to 3G, and that is in the education article section 7108. So the language is um, exactly is taken from there. So is there a second? I will second this. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Are there no. any questions or comments concerning the amendments? May I speak to my motion? Sure, go ahead, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, so I'll just very briefly speak to each of these. Um, the first strike is to take out the transition for these purposes. Um, by moving um, this section, the board may refuse the use of any school facility. It's it's in the first section, which really speaks to our vision and doesn't seem to belong there. It's um, more in line with the section in part three of the policy, which is why I moved it to G um, rather than up front and kind of tucked right there in the mission. Um, deleting for community purposes is because it's redundant with the sentence before it. We talk about four community purposes and then we say again for community purposes, so it's to take out redundant languages or language. Um, the replacement of the use of school facilities for cultural, civic, educational, recreational and charitable purposes is a longstanding practice replaces that language specifically with the uses that are defined in the statute. So the, um, that sentence that it re that replaces it is pulled directly from the education article 7108 as is the sentence that follows the insert um, about partisan political organizations. And I included this because it answers a question that um, is raised in the community quite often and that, that there's a lot of misinformation um, out there in the community and the statute, um, this is directly from the statute as well. So thank you, Ms. Rowe. Are there any other questions related to the amendment of this policy? Mr. Thomas, I see you typing. Do you have a question or comment? Yeah, I had a question, but I believe Dr. Hager, Ms. Mack, and Ms. Oh, Collins. Sorry. 
It's okay. Got okay. Who is next? I've got things out of order in the chat here. Dr. Hager was next. Okay, Dr. Hager. Um, I appreciate that um, Ms. Hen sent the um, this uh, statute to our or brought this statute to our attention, and I see that some things are included and some things aren't. I think I'd prefer to have the verbatim language of the whole statute in the policy or not. I feel like it's um, reading the amendment. It didn't read to me as clearly as the way the verbatim statute is presented. Um, and also the way the statute says that the superintendent, um, if an application is made to the superintendent, then the board has to provide use of the school facility for each of these uses, which seems like a role that the board has not taken on before in Baltimore County. And so if we're going with this language verbatim, then it feels like this is a bigger discussion and maybe maybe the policy should should go back to be revised before we we move forward with it. So uh, members of the committee, uh, Dr. Hager, uh, the board owns the property. So the way that the uh, that the process has worked in the past, the application is made to the superintendent through each school and then through Ms. Becker. And it's the board's policy that we comply with in order to determine whether or not to grant access or use of school facilities. Uh, so it's this part of the statute has been in effect for almost as long as I've been here and we've been doing it the same way. Um, again, contemplating that this is how the policy is followed, how the law is followed based on our policy. It's not that the board reads all of the applications for student for um, community use, um, Ms. Becker can speak to how many we receive in a year. Uh, that is not, I don't think that the board would want to read through applications for community use. And Ms. Exactly, no, I agree. Ms. Howie, agree. can you also explain for the benefit of the committee and those watching the agreement that the board has with the county government and our use, our use of school facilities agreement that we have for with them, because that encompasses also a broad range of activities that rec councils use the schools for. And I'm, I'm aware in my own community that at different times, all of these things have taken place at schools under the rec council permits. So if you could explain that. So there is a joint use agreement in effect with county government and county government uh, through their rec councils are able to use certain parts of our property, uh, including the fields. Uh, they do have um, precedence over other community uses. Okay, Ms. Hen. Did you have another comment? Um, Ms. Howie clarified, and there were only um, two cases I believe in the statute that called for specific board approval. One is the new language that we're adding, um, the refusal of permission. If, let's see, if it seems that the use would um, be a threat that we're adding. Um, and there was one other exception. Other than that, we grant the authority to the superintendent. Okay. Yes, that would be clear and present danger, ma'am. But again, in terms of the operation and how this actually works, yes. uh, we do not bring, staff does not bring to the board for board vote. Uh, this is uh, delegated to the superintendent and his staff. Correct. Are there any other questions for the amendment? Um, one comment I had. Yes. Um, there, this amendment incorporates more of the language from the statute. There may be, I would be open to any other amendments that add all of it. I tried to incorporate as much of it as possible um, that wasn't redundant and, and already included in the existing policy. So to Dr. Hager's point, I thought it was all captured here. If not added, then captured somewhere else. But if there are any pieces that that weren't captured here, we can certainly amend it to include. So I do commend you, Ms. Hen, for um, 
bringing the specific language into the policy. My one question to the committee for the committee's consideration is once if it is in statute, obviously it's in statute and there are requirements and you can't change the statute, you can change the policy. The question is whether or not as you're looking to change the policy, does the language not only reflect what's in the statute, but is it the desire of the board for how the board which is, wishes to operate as long as it's not contrary to the statute? Given that you have the limitations of the law, what is it and how is it that you want the system to comply with what is in statute that you can't change, if that makes sense, ma'am? It does, and I think that the committee is going to have to consider that when we vote on this amendment. Did you all understand um, what Ms. Howie meant? Uh, Christian? Kind of. Um. So basically what she's saying is we can articulate what's in statute in our policy, um, but do we do we want to? Does the policy actually reflect? If it's in statute, we have to do it but how the statute plays out, is that reflected in our policy, in the language, the way we're presenting the language? Because it is, you can't change the statute, you can right. change the policy, and you certainly cannot change the policy if it contradicts with the statute. And I think Ms. Hen uh, alluded to this in her comments that you have members of the public who have misconceptions, misperceptions of how the system works. And those members of the public are going to refer to your policy, not to state law as their first, as their first go-to, if you will. Uh, they'll look at how the board is implementing its policy and what its policy is. So what best reflects uh, what the board wants to convey to its public. I actually like the way Ms. Hen has laid this out because one of the reasons why members of our community has had to go through the rec councils to get permits is because uh, they were told no from the school system for things that are in statute because it wasn't in policy. So I feel like it's not just the public that's referencing policy, it's also school system staff and articulating that these uses include some things for which there is confusion, I think is, I think this, I think this amend, these amendments are very useful. Um, Ms. Mack? Uh, Ms. Rowe, if, I, I think my question is germane to the amendment, but if it's not, stop me. The question that I had on this policy, I believe this amendment might take care of, is on page one, line 11, and then on page two, line eight, <clears throat> Who, did, who makes the determination that the use of a school facility will or may provoke or add to a public riot or breach of the peace or create a clear and present danger to the peace and welfare of the county or state? And how do we ensure that the determination is equitable and is not arbitrary or capricious? So if Ms. Hen's um, motion addresses that, then I don't have another question. Ms. Rowe, may I speak to that and Go ahead, ask a question? Thank you. And thank you, Ms. Mack, for the question. So I thought about that a lot with this when I was working on this um, motion. And the statute reads the county board. So it's it's clear that it's the board um, versus say, the superintendent because they differentiate the two in the statute. But I wasn't sure that our language made that clear. And to your second point, it it doesn't address that. Um, how we make the decision um, in terms of our own governance. So my question from Ms. Howie is, does our language or is our language specific enough to state that the board will make this decision or do we need additional language here? And do you have any recommendations for Ms. Max follow up? So you do have your implementation language page two, line 33, that the, that the board directs the superintendent to implement the policy. Uh, if it is the board's desire that the board that now receives under the revised policy, the applications for community use 
uh, then that's the board's desire. Ms. Howie? Oh, I believe it's specifically what Ms. Max is asking about and where I had this dilemma was specifically for recommendations of the superintendent to refuse permission on these these particular grounds. So in my recollection, um, dating back to Dr. Berger, I don't recall any superintendent bringing forward uh, a request for community use to be approved by the board. Uh, even though it's the board's property, certainly uh, that uh, authority has been delegated to the superintendent of schools uh, as well, uh, or however I should say, I don't recall there being a community use that would have caused uh, clear and present danger, presented a clear and present danger. It's There's just not one coming to the front of my mind at this point. I'll defer to Mr. Dixit and Ms. Becker. If there's been one in the recent past, uh, for which staff had or about which staff had concerns. Uh, so again, if there is it, Ms. Mack, and I apologize, I didn't uh, address your question directly initially, but it would be the way I read this policy, the superintendent would be required to act on this policy because the superintendent is being directed to implement the policy. And Mr. Dixit, Ms. Becker, have there been any requests for use that have presented a clear and present danger or for which uh, staff was concerned about the school facilities or safety of our students or our families. So everything that Ms. Howard you have mentioned is absolutely correct. There have not been any instances uh, that I can recall. And if there were, uh, I want to share with the board that the first person that looks at the application is the principal and principal makes the initial decision. If the principal needs any help, they will contact Miss Becker or I for the for advice. And if we feel that there's further help needed, then we'll contact Department of uh, School Safety and get their advice on that. So no decision has been made arbitrarily if there were uh, issues that we thought required help, we'll consult with them and then we will share with the deputy superintendent or superintendent before making a final decision. Also, I would like to share with the board that there were 85 of 88,000 occurrences that were approved in last 12 months for the use of facilities. So there are large numbers that we are talking about and making any changes uh, will we'll definitely will have to look at the enforcement of that policy implications. OK, I just want to state. Um, different people have put things in the chat that they now need to say out loud. Because the chat is not part of the open meeting, so. Um, Jeez, where to start? I'm just going to read the chat very quickly. So there's different people questions on the amendment. Ms. Causey says question on motion. Statute 7-108 use of school property for other than school purposes in general. D, each county board may permit the use of public school facilities for religious or other lawful purposes. And then Ms. Hen says that is covered in the list, I believe. Ms. Tom, Mr. Thomas says it is covered in the list just reworded. Ms. Causey says appeal process if superintendent rejects or revokes use of school facility request. Ms. Mack wants to speak to her question. <laughs> and Mr. Thomas from Ms. Hen. Mr. Thomas, what is that? <laughs> the board encourages. Copied, I, it was, oh, you I copied was, the motion. Yeah, I copied the portion of the motion that addresses Ms. Causey's question. Yeah. OK, so we are in the middle of processing a motion. Who has a question on the motion? Dr. Hager, I believe you're next. Ms. Mack was next and then Dr. Hager. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Ms. Mack, go ahead. 
I just I appreciate the information that Ms. Howie and Mr. Dixit provided. I I don't know that my concern has been addressed to the point that I know how I would vote on this amendment simply because especially when Mr. Dixit said it starts with the principle. We all see things through a different lens and how do we know that our principles not through any um, mal intent are are being uniform and equitable in the decisions they make. And that bothers me. It, it just creates a, a question for me. And I don't want these to come to the board, but I do believe the board should have some insights into things that are rejected. So that's my comment. So, Ms. Mack, um, that, so I feel like because the language that you're talking about is going to, stay in the policy whether this motion passes or not because it's already there this idea of the board may refuse the use of any school facilities it's there um, miss miss hen is just suggesting moving it to another place in the policy so that stays in the policy whether we approve this motion or not i think that um to address your concern people can appeal decisions of the superintendent to the board but what we might do, as we have done in some other policies, is where it says the board directs the superintendent to implement this policy, we could also require a report on applications that have been rejected and the reasons for them being rejected. And they could be produced as informational items in the board agenda. So I, let's, I, process, I, I, let's Ms. process this amendment Ms. first and then we can look at that. Mr. Thomas? I believe Dr. Hager's before me and then. Oh, Do Dr. Hager, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to revisit what Ms. Howie had said earlier, and I, I hope this is a correct interpretation, but from my light Googling, it looks as if this statute has been updated or amended in 2017, 2018, 2020. And so my concern is by being so specific in our language that we're not going to keep up to date with the education article that is cited in the policy. And so I have very mixed feelings about adding this language in here, given that the statute may change. And the point of adding the language is to be in line with the statute. But I think by, by citing the statute and linking to it and providing those hyperlinks like we were told to do um, could potentially remedy the situation should it be updated again before our policy is updated. So with respect to the hyperlinks, ma'am, uh, the hyperlinks that I believe are referred to and were referred to in the public works recommendations had to do with links to related policies, related documents that are produced by the school system. So what we've done in response, as indicated in the policy analysis, is we have provided hyperlinks to superintendent's rules uh, when there is a related rule uh, to that particular policy. And as I indicated with respect to amending the policy to conform with the statute, the question is always, and there will always be this tension, that as you amend uh, your policies to track with statutory language, there will always be a question about whether or not it has to be amended again. And the legislature meets once a year. So it's possible that this may be further amended uh, next year, and it's possible that uh, staff will be coming back to you saying the statute's been amended. We believe these changes uh, are necessary based on the amendment. I quite frankly don't think you can get away from that tension. Uh, the, the question's going to be, and the analysis that staff will undertake, is whether or not even with an amended statute, do you need to change your policy in any way? Okay, are there any more questions on the amendment? Mr. Yes, Thompson, Mr. No. let's make this very quick because we're very behind our schedule and we're only on our second policy. Okay, and my question is- And left in the meeting. Okay, my question is, so in the language in the statute versus the language in the policy, um, the statute says, and I'm just gonna copy this real quick, each county board may permit a partisan a partisan political organization and each county board may permit the use of school of public school facilities for religious or other lawful purposes it doesn't require us to to require that it's staying may if i'm interpreting that correctly um so 
in the wording that Miss Hen provided, it changes to it doesn't say may at that point. It doesn't say that we have like we may. I mean, except the fact that we can not allow something as was stated earlier. But it says, you know, partisan political organizations with at least 10 percent of the vote cast may use school facilities for meetings. I don't know. I just feel like I really like prefer it if, if staff could look at undertaking and incorporate this policy together with their expertise um, in, 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 in ma making sure that all the components of the statute are in the policy. I just feel like there's a lot of. There are I feel like everything might be covered, but I, I don't know for sure, and I, I just think that we should have staff be the ones who comply and put everything into the policy. OK, um, let's vote. We have a, a motion amended and second on the floor, so let's uh, let's vote on that. Ms. Clark, would you call the roll on the amendment? Excuse me, Ms. Rowe. I, I had had in the chat that I had a question on this. And. I, you are I, the last person who's asking a question on this amendment. <laughs> Go ahead. OK, well, it, it's been in the chat that I had questions, so thank I you. I understand we have we're ending this meeting at six. It is 5.53. OK, thank you. Um, so I appreciate all the discussion and I appreciate Ms. Hen um making her motion i do not believe that the way hers is stated includes everything um that should be included because uh she includes the a statement around church affiliated civic purposes but in the statute it identifies um <clears throat> what i had written earlier in the chat here thank you um each county board may permit the use of public school facilities for religious or other lawful purposes because there are religious purposes that do not affiliate with a church. For instance, it might be a synagogue, it might be a mosque, it might be another house of worship. Um, so I agree with Mr. Thomas that I think we can ask staff to incorporate each of those mays into the policy because I think that we should be as inclusive as the state law allows. We should be as diverse uh, as the state law allows and not as a uh, line, as it says on page two line, um, excuse me, line 10, subject to the restrictions outlined in this policy, but it does not include um, subject to the inclusions in statute 7-108. So I think we should make it even more inclusive. I'm going to vote yes on this to move this fo piece forward um, on all of her um, changes and then um, maybe by consensus uh, the committee can ask staff to include each of those other uses. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm done now. Ms. Clark, will you please call the roll on the amendments? Ms. Causey. Yes. Dr. Hager. No. Ms. Hen. Yes. Ms. Math. Yes. Mr. Thomas. No. Ms. Rowe. Yes. OK, so the amendments carry. Um, Ms. Ms. Rowe. Yes. I have a. Um, a motion on this. Okay. Uh, it's, in, it's in the chat and it it addresses my concern about not wanting these to come to the board, but also needing wanting to know the reasons that we've Your, denied them. And the motion is motion. the superintendent shall provide quarterly reports to the board uh, to the board of refusals of facility requests with the reasons. I guess I should say with the reasons for those refusals. OK, I'll second that. Um, do, do we need comments and questions on this? I think we already discussed the reasons for it. Can we just vote on it, Mr. Thomas? What does quarterly mean? Like quarterly in terms of, of a board in term, a year? Every three years, every three months. Every three months? Yeah, so every three months they put in, they inform the board in the informational section of the meeting of refusals for facility requests and the reasons. OK. OK, so Next. members of the committee, is it your desire that the quarterly reports um, be 
as information provided during board meetings or do you want uh, a report during a board meeting? Is this an agenda item you're adding to your um, very dense meetings? I won't speak for the rest of the people on the call. I would be satisfied as getting this as an informational item. I'd be okay. satisfied with Thank informational. Does anyone else object to informational items? Okay, Ms. Clark, would you call the roll on the amendment to add the superintendent shall provide quarterly reports to the board of refusals of facility requests with reasons? And I added four refusals just to be clear, Ms. Rowe. It might be redundant, but whatever. It, it's the same meaning. Yes, Ms. Causey. Yes. Dr. Hager. Yes. Ms. Hen. Yes. Ms. Mack. Yes. Mr. Thomas. Yes. Ms. Rowe. Yes. Motion carries. If there are no objections. Policy. What's the number of this policy? Policy 1300 will be moved forward for first reader. Ms. Rowe. Sorry, Ms. Rowe. Do you object to Mr. Thomas? I thought that we were going to discuss. What about the things that aren't we're, outlined? As we're policy? leaving in two minutes, so we're either moving this forward or we're leaving it on the agenda for the next PRC committee meeting. Ms. Hur, do we need to vote on it as amended? We already did that. We passed the amendment. Now we're either doing a consensus vote to move it forward to first reader okay. or we're leaving it on the agenda and adjourning the meeting. OK, what I don't does feel, the committee I, wish to do. I object. I don't feel comfortable moving okay. it forward. Um, not to say I moved to ask that staff incorporate the other components not outlined in Ms. Hen's amendment to the policy. OK, so Mr. Thomas, you're making a motion to send it back to staff to review all of these amendments and the statute and add all the maze. Yes. Is that the motion? Yes. OK, is there a second? Second, Mac. OK, um, there's a second. Um, we don't have time to debate this. Let's just call the vote. Uh, Ms. Clark, would you call the vote, please? I think we all know why the motion has been made. Ms. Causey? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Okay, so this policy is moving um, back to staff to review the desires of the committee and the amendments and to incorporate all the maze that are in the statute. Um, Ms. Rowe, I had I had put in the chat before Mr. Thomas's or uh, to, I moved to amend policy 1300 page two line 10. Insert you, can do that. you can do that when it comes back to the committee because okay. we're in the meeting. It, um, can I have a motion to I, I'm I'm reading it because of the Open Meetings Act. Motion to adjourn. Um, okay. Oh, I'm after sorry. Written applications. Move to amend policy 1300 page two line 10 insert after written application subject to included purposes and statute. 7-108. If there's no objections, okay. I would like the committee to request staff to include that. Staff could review and include that if it seems appropriate to all the other legal reviews. I think that would be good. We can review, Ms. Kazi, take notes on that because we can review that. This will come back to the committee and we will do more work on it. Can I have a motion to move the items unfinished on the agenda to the next agenda? So moved. And Thomas. All right, if there's no objections, all of the remaining items on today's agenda will be moved to the next agenda. Can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All right, um, if there's no objection, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Have a nice night. Have a great night, everyone. Good night, committee members. Night. Thank Thanks, you, Steve. So. Miss Howie. Oh, I think this is my last PRC meeting. Whoa, wow.